Before you begin your build, you'll want to establish and set up a comfortable working environment. You're going to be spending a lot of time working on this project and it's very rewarding, but you do want to be comfortable while you're doing it. Uh, you'll need a considerable amount of space, a minimum of a two-car garage. Um, in a two-car garage, it's very possible, several t tons of builders have accomplished it in this space, and you move to a hangar for final assembly. and it's great. It will be cramped, so be very careful um, and plan accordingly to store your parts as you finish them uh, creatively up against the wall or uh, basically just out of the way. A lot of people who build in a two-car garage end up invading spare bedrooms and things like that for components, um, so don't be surprised if that happens. But it is possible, it's very doable, and uh, ve like I said, very many people have done it this way. Um, so the heart of your shop is going to be your work tables. Um, uh, the KAI says to build two foot by eight foot uh, tables, uh, four of them. Uh, this is great. I highly recommend putting them onto casters, uh, locking casters, so you can constantly reconfigure your workspace uh, as parts get built and different things are kind of uh, under construction. You'll want to continuously be moving around and adapting to the new uh, phase of your build. Uh, this table you see here is four foot by eight foot. Uh, it's just really easy to throw together a table like this uh, because plywood comes in four foot by eight foot sheets. So, and two by fours come in eight foot long lengths. So you can slap it together really easily without very much cutting. I highly recommend always putting a bottom shelf on your table. Uh, if you don't put a bottom shelf, you're just kind of wasting precious space. Uh, there's uh, four foot by eight foot storage down there and it doesn't take up any more of your valuable floor space. Um, like I said, locking casters are very important. You'll be constantly moving around and you do want the table to be sturdy and stationary uh, when it's where you need it. Um, I have several of these tables here in this shop, but a minimum of two of the four foot by eight foot or a minimum of four of the two foot by eight foot will be required. Um, in addition to that, you'll want to set up some way, as I mentioned in the uh, uh, part prep video, you'll want to set up some way of storing your parts and keeping yourself organized throughout the build. I have uh, these carts, also unlocking casters, um, with pegboard, and it keeps me, all my parts are visibly accessible as well as physically accessible, and it doesn't take up very much space. You can use the wall, a lot of people use the lid of their kits and you can lean it up against your wall if you don't want to uh, put staple holes in your wall. Uh, all of these things are great ideas. Uh, it's just really a matter of uh, keeping yourself organized and keeping things out of the way. You don't want to waste your valuable table space spreading parts all over um, when you can do it this way. Uh, so now let's go through the list of uh, most commonly used tools. As I mentioned in the part prep video, uh, I highly recommend the DRDD2 uh, dimple tool. Uh, it's very easy to use, it's straightforward, and it works consistently every time. Um, you can use the, there's like a, a whack-a-mole type style dimpler, uh, there's hand dimplers, and you may use a hand dimpler here and there when uh, the part doesn't quite fit around this uh, large base area here. Uh, but this is, this is really the heart of the dimpling that I do here. So I highly recommend this tool. And keep in mind throughout this whole tool explanation, I'm not advocating for any specific tool brand over another. I'm just talking about styles of tools and uh, it's really up to you what fits your budget and your preferences for work style and everything like that. So let's move on to some of the other components. A much more thorough list of the required tools is in the KAI. Uh, what I'm going to go over here are the tools that I use almost every day building these planes, and um, they're the most essential of the tools required. Um, you'll run into some little things here and there that take a specialty tool. Um, 
For example, you will end up needing a wire stripper tool, uh, crimpers and things like that. Um, but I don't use them every day. So these are the tools that'll really just kind of get you started. And if you prefer to buy everything off the bat, the full list is in the KAI. Uh, if you prefer to kind of purchase things as you need them, um, that's kind of what I recommend because you won't necessarily need every single tool that's in the listed KAI, um, but you will need every single one of these tools. So uh, to start off, you'll need Clicos, and you'll need a lot of Clicos. Um, 300 of the, the uh, bronze eighth inch Clicos is a minimum. Um, you'll end up sacrificing a lot of them when you're doing your fuel tanks. Uh, they get kind of gummed up. You can clean them out with acetone, but they'll never really be fully clean again. Uh, they're fairly inexpensive, and after you've used them on the fuel tanks, I really recommend just throwing them away. So it doesn't hurt to have extra Clicos. Uh, it really does hurt to not have enough. Uh, so keep that in mind. About 200 of the black four millimeter Clicos uh, is gonna be needed. Uh, you might be able to get away with 150, but like I said, I'm, I always lean on the side of having slightly too many than not enough. Um, it's really problematic if you're trying to build a part and you don't have enough Clicos. Um, you'll need about 50 of these uh, gold colored Clicos, the 4.8 millimeter Clicos. Uh, you'll need at least about 50 or 60 of these. Um, they're not used very often, uh, but when they are used, you'll definitely need them. Uh, typically, you'll end up using them like four at a time, but there are some components on the wings where you'll need several. So that's those. And the 330 seconds, uh, 2.4 millimeter Clicos, you're not going to barely use these. Uh, don't get a whole lot. I have. I don't know, 50 or 60 of them here. And I think I've probably only used a total of 20 or 30 of them ever at any time. And that's just because I have them. Uh, these are, you'll wanna get you know, 30, 40, maybe 50 if you want, uh, but these, you're pretty much not gonna use them. For installing Clicos, you'll need a couple pairs of Clico pliers. Um, they're fairly inexpensive, so it's better to have more than one just so you, uh, have easier uh, time finding them pretty much. There's a couple different styles. This one is spring-loaded. It makes it much easier when you're continuously uh, pulling and installing Clicos. Uh, the non-spring type, you just kind of have to figure out a, a comfortable way with your fingers here to, to operate them. It's uh, perfectly functional. I do prefer the spring ones, but they can kind of like spring load out of your hand. So watch out for that. You definitely don't want to drop it on a skin. Uh, in addition to that, there's also the vertical style Clico tool. Uh, I don't use this very often, but uh, it does come in handy when you uh, run into a situation where it's required. Uh, you'll definitely need a good set of drill bits. I recommend, highly recommend getting a high quality set of drill bits. Uh, one high end set of drill bits should last you throughout the whole build. But even still, especially your eighth inch and four millimeter, three thirty seconds uh, drill bits will start to, to get dull on you by the end of the build. Um, so definitely get a high quality set. You don't want to be pushing through the metal. You really want to be drilling through the metal. Um, in addition to that, well, of course, this is going to come in handy all the time throughout the build. You'll be drilling constantly. You'll be countersinking. Uh, an, a good quality cordless drill is a must have. Um, I really like this uh, 90 degree adapter for drilling. Uh, it lets you kind of get into some spaces where you wouldn't otherwise be able to access just with the uh, large chuck of a, of a cordless drill. Uh, this comes in handy very, very, very often. Um, I actually use this almost all the time instead of the long drill bits. Uh, there will be some instances where a long drill bit is preferable uh, because even the head here is a little bit too large to uh, properly access the hole you're trying to drill. But um, I, I really do recommend one of these. And then for these, you'll need the impact style uh, drill bit fitting. So keep that in mind as well. Um, you'll need a countersink tool. Uh, I highly recommend uh, something that has an automatic stop on it, rather than just trying to uh, countersink holes freehand. Uh, the stop on this comes in really handy. 
you can set the depth and and get your countersinks completely uniform and the same and the proper depth throughout the uh, countersinking process, especially for the wing spars. Um, it's pretty much a must have for the spars. Now, the harder your build is going to be pretty much your rivet guns. These things probably get used more often than any other tool. Um, I prefer pneumatic rivet guns. There are, there's one electric rivet gun that I'm aware of made by Milwaukee. Uh, I don't have one, I don't use them. Uh, I've heard good things, but I'm pretty sure that the good things that those people say they haven't tried one of these. I, I cannot recommend enough, and once again, I'm not paid to advertise for any of this stuff. Um, the Stanley Pro Set XT2. This actually has an airstream from, from the uh, compressor that pulls from the nose piece through the collector here. So every rivet you pull, the mandrel actually automatically sucks up and gets collected into this uh, collection chamber here. Um, this is night and day, the fastest, the most efficient way to pull all your rivets. Uh, in addition to that, it's fairly low profile. The nose piece is, uh, is thinner than most other pneumatic riveters. Uh, this, is a, this is a huge uh, help to your build. Um, this is a similar gun to the Stanley Pro Set. It's uh, made by Sumaki. Um, I don't know of anywhere to source this from except for uh, one person online. So if you're interested in this one, it's about half the price as the Pro Set. Uh, it's a little bit bulkier. It's uh, a little bit heavier. And the nose piece is slightly larger, but it does have the same functionality as the Pro Set and it, it, it'll get you through a whole build. Um, it's, it's very effective and it's a good, good tool. And it comes with all the nose pieces, so does the Pro Set. All the nose pieces required for all the different rivet sizes throughout your build. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a good alternative to this, uh, but this is a better product. Um, these are the Harbor Freight, if you're in America, uh, the cheap hardware store, uh, pneumatic riveters. I do not, I can't recommend using this gun. Uh, the trigger pull is much longer than just the little button on these. Uh, it's very heavy and every time it pulls a rivet, it drops it out the nose piece or you have to tilt it back to get it to go into the collection chamber. Um, they're also not particularly effective. Um, they'll work and they'll get you through a build, but it won't be the same uh, enjoyable process as with one of these here. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'm not trying to sell these. Sumaki's the brand. If you can find a way to source them, um, uh, go ahead. So a hand rivet puller, uh, this will be key in some areas. Sometimes you'll uh, just need to pull a rivet or two and uh, you don't want to turn your compressor on or, or any of that. So yeah, I guess it's uh, self-explanatory that for any of these three rivet guns, you will need an air compressor. So if noise is an issue for where you're going to be building, uh, keep that in mind and you might want to go the electric rivet gun route. Uh, the hand riveter, like I said, uh, will come in handy sometimes. Um, riv nut tools are very important. You're going to be pulling a lot of riv nuts. Uh, there's basically two options. A pneumatic riv nut puller is, they're, they're very, very expensive. If you want to get one, they work great. Um, but I don't recommend it. I don't think it's worth the cost. Um, so there's the hand rivet, uh, riv nut puller. Uh, these work really well. Uh, they are really hard to squeeze, so you'll, you'll either need two hands or a really strong hand. Um, so I actually use this probably 90% of the rift nuts I pull. It's much faster than this option. This option is much easier. It attaches to your uh, drill chuck. And on a low speed, it'll pull your riv nut for you. Um, you can set your torque adjustment on your uh, cordless drill so that when the riv nut is basically pulled in all the way, it'll automatically uh, pull this, uh, the, the torque adjustment will stop the drill from spinning further. What I find is that the battery level on the drill determines a lot of how much uh, 
torque is actually being applied for the torque setting on this. So watch out for that. Um, this is a perfectly effective tool. It's very fast. It's certainly easier than this, but it does take up a lot more space and uh, you have potential for pulling the rivet nut too hard and stripping the threads from inside. So uh, I, I do like this tool a lot. A uh, hand seamer is gonna be used fairly often. Uh, I use this so when I describe in the video for part prep, uh, sometimes when you dimple, it can cause a little edge of, of your rib to flare up or basically the ribs have all the uh, flanges and you want them to be a nice smooth curve. And so just to get in there with the hand seamer and kind of bend it perfectly straight and watch that contour come into, uh, into position there, uh, this will be a really helpful tool for that. Also just any, any skins or anything that might have just a slight tweak on them, this will fix it really quickly. And they have a smooth surface in here so it doesn't mar the metal like a pair of pliers might. Uh, you'll need a set of Allen wrenches. I recommend getting one with a handle, a set with a handle and removable bits. Um, but these uh, 90 degree standard Allen wrenches will get the job done as well. Um, torque wrench, you'll definitely be using a torque wrench. Um, one thing that I've found is you'll need to find a torque wrench that goes low enough. So the AN3 bolts have a very low torque setting. It's barely past snug. And so a lot of larger torque wrenches won't actually read low enough. So make sure to find one that goes down to, uh, to uh, 25 inch pounds. Uh, then standard tools. So you'll need a socket set with ratchets and wrenches. And so this is fairly standard uh, kind of toolbox stuff. So you'll need a, an automotive set will work just fine with a complete set of wrenches and a complete set of ratchets and sockets. Uh, I really like the ratcheting wrenches. Uh, I really recommend these, but uh, they're not necessary. Uh, pliers and flush cutters. I use flush cutters all the time. Um, the best function for a flush cutter is when you have to remove a rivet, you drill out the top of the rivet and grab the back side of the rivet with the flush cutter and just pull just slightly and it'll pop it out for you rather than trying to push the drill bit all the way through and potentially enlarging that hole. Um, so I keep one, one pair of flush cutters exclusively for removing rivets and another for clipping wires because once you start removing rivets with it, uh, it does uh, damage the cutting surface, but it'll be per perfectly functional for removing rivets. A uh, set of screwdrivers is gonna be needed. Uh, so have all of that stuff on uh, as well. And lastly, uh, you'll need measuring tools. So uh, this plane is entirely in metric. So make sure your measuring, measuring tools have uh, metric uh, measurement on them. Uh, I use this 18 inch, uh, well, 450 millimeter uh, scale very often. Uh, I probably use this the most. It's just a six inch, 150 millimeter scale. Uh, I use it very often. It's, it really helps you when you're trying to fit stuff in perfectly uh, just to get an exact measurement. And it's not, it's compact enough so that you can get it in and, and uh, do what you need to do. Um, and lastly, I use a set of digital calipers uh, very often for the same purpose as the six inch scale, but these are just a little bit more accurate and a digital caliper with metric. You don't have to worry about reading the veneers and things like that. Uh, so I use this very often. So a couple tools that I forgot to mention are, of course, you're gonna be deburring a lot. So you'll need a full set of deburring tools. Uh, if you want an uh, explanation of the ones that I prefer to use, I did a, a more thorough in-depth explanation of that in the uh, part prep video. Um, but basically you'll need something to deburr holes, um, edges, I prefer a file, it's, it's quick and easy, or um, one of these guys here with the angled rotating head on it. Um, this can replace the file if you prefer, it really just comes down to personal preference on what's easiest for you and most effective. Um, and lastly, this uh, angled rivet puller is going to be crucial in some steps of the build. So. 
I don't use it every day, but you will probably run into, well, you'll definitely run into situations where it's needed. Uh, it's got a taper down here where it's wider at this end than on this end. So effectively, sometimes there'll be, say, a, a wall here and you're trying to rivet, um, you know, right here. And so you can't quite get the nose of the rivet gun perfectly uh, perpendicular to the rivet um, or to the surface that's being riveted. So because of that angle, this takes that angle out of it. And so you'll shoot the rivet and it'll transfer the force up to the rivet gun and make sure your rivet's pulled perfectly uh, flat on the surface. Uh, so they make different sizes of these uh, for eighth inch rivets and four millimeter rivets. I recommend getting one for each um, just so you have them on hand when they're needed. Uh, so that's pretty much it for the tools that I use frequently. Um, like I said before, this is not a comprehensive list of every single tool that you'll need. Uh, for example, a cordless Dremel. I very much prefer the battery operated Dremel to the one with a cord. It's just more manageable um, and easier to get into, into uh, places. Uh, you'll need one of those, uh, definitely. Um, but yeah, like I said, these are the tools that I use just about every day. And uh, for the rest of the tools, you can kind of wait until you run into the situation where you do need it and order it as needed. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's, that's it.